All right. Well, remember, Paul has been showing us that we have all sinned and we've all failed to live up to God's standards. And so we all fall short of his glory, which means that none of us can enter into heaven on our own merits. We cannot do it. And we'll see more of that actually uh, this morning. But what we could not do, God did. He sent his son to offer himself on the cross so that if we believe in him, which means more than believing the facts, remember, if we trust him, trust him alone for salvation, that he will give us the righteousness that justifies, that gives us peace with God and the certain hope that we will be with Him. We'll no longer fall short of the glory of God, but now we have the hope of the glory of God. But Paul went on to say that being justified doesn't mean that it's going to be smooth sailing from here on out. Okay, yes, chapter 6, we died with Christ and we were raised with Him. We are no longer slaves to sin. Now we are free to serve God, but our flesh, our sin still fights against us. We want to do what God commands, but sadly, we still want to do what God forbids. Now, the way Paul describes it in Romans chapter 7, he says it's essentially a will against a will. It's no longer I who, who does it, but the sin which, which that's within me because the real me really wants to serve the Lord. But nevertheless, we still have two desires, and when we give in to the one desire, it's because that's what we want to do. Sadly, far too often, we find ourselves doing what it is we don't want to do. So much so, Paul said at the at, you know, end of the last chapter, by crying out, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? And again, the answer, of course, is Jesus. He has, and he continues to do so by his Holy Spirit. Now, that's really what this section is about, and, and that's what we want to look at this morning. Now, Paul begins, first of all, with an encouragement. If we are trusting in Christ, we will not be condemned, he says in verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we know from what he says in Romans that even though we have this struggle, our flesh fighting against the Spirit, the spirit against the flesh. Even though we're not always able to do what in our hearts we really want to do, what the true us wants to do, because we're in Christ, we will not end up in hell. But I, I want us to notice something here. Paul doesn't take his argument in the direction that we might expect him to. Uh, it's important for us to see this, otherwise we're not going to understand what he's talking about that we won't be condemned, I mean, this is the way we might expect him to go, that we won't be condemned because Jesus has removed our guilt through the cross and clothed us with his perfect record of righteousness because he's justified us by his righteousness. Now, Paul did say that earlier, and that is true. Justification by grace through faith alone. He points to Abraham as the example. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That is the great and glorious gospel of free grace. Okay. Now this time though, what he is saying is we will not be condemned. That is true because not of the justification, although yes, it is because of that, but that's not what he's pointing to. He's pointing to sanctification because Jesus has broken the power of sin in our hearts because we no longer practice the things that bear fruit for death, that lead to condemnation. I want you to notice what he says in verse 2, because this, look at the direction he's going. This is why he tells us there is no condemnation, for or because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. And what he is saying here is there's no condemnation because he has set us free from our sin, from our corruption, by His Holy Spirit. Now, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ is referring to the new principle, the new law, the new nature that the Lord has put within our hearts. Okay, that is the, that love 
for what is good and right, that love for the law, that love for holiness, this new desire, okay, this is what broke the bondage that we are under, the slavery that we are under to sin, that freed us from the law of sin and death, which refers to our flesh. Okay, that, that's important to see. The law of the spirit of life is the new principle the spirit gives us. The law of sin and death is that principle of flesh that's still within us. Now, before the Lord gave us His Holy Spirit, we only had one desire, the desire for sin. And that desire controlled us, okay? But with this new desire that the Spirit gives us, sin no longer has a monopoly on us, okay? Now we have a choice. We don't have to do the things that lead to condemnation. Now, what is Paul saying here? He's, he's giving us a very familiar Reformation principle. Justification is by grace through faith alone. But that doesn't mean by a faith that is alone, okay? He doesn't mean, Paul is not, when he, when he tells us that we're justified by grace through faith alone, he doesn't mean that we can have heaven without being freed from sin, you know, without, without that bondage being broken, that we can live as we want and still go to heaven. You see, that's the antinomian way. That's the way that most evangelicals, I would say many evangelicals, I have to say at least many, believe. It's the way that perhaps we may have believed in the past. You know, I, I trust in Jesus. I, I prayed the prayer. Um, I'm on my way to heaven. And I don't have to worry. It doesn't really matter if I obey, if I don't obey, if I pursue righteousness or not, if I put my sins to death or not. Yes, it does matter whether we do that, because Paul is going to conclude this particular point by saying that if, you know, we live according to the flesh, we will die. But if we live according to the Spirit or put to death the deeds of the flesh through the Spirit, we will live. When God took away the guilt of our sin on the cross through Christ, at the same time, He has been arguing that He has freed us from the power of sin. Now, He's already told us the law could not do this, the law is holy, the law is good, but it couldn't give us the ability, it couldn't give us the power to obey. Remember, Paul's already argued that the only thing the law could really do is stir up our sin, provoke our sin, make our sin abound, okay? Because that was all that was in our hearts when the Lord came to us and showed us His law. All there was was sin, and that law simply provokes sin. It couldn't give us the power to keep it. And so what the law could not do, God did by sending His Son into the world in the likeness of sinful flesh. And again, just as an aside, Jesus became one with us, and He looked like us. He didn't look like a perfect man. He looked in the likeness of sinful flesh, but He was sinless. He offered Himself on the cross for our sins, and in so doing, Paul says, he condemned sin in the flesh in verse 3. And what he means by that is he removed its power. He made it let go of us by giving to us his spirit. So that his purpose behind this was this, so that what he requires in the law might be fulfilled in us so that we would actually obey that law. Now, we often read that verse so that the law might be fulfilled in us. We often read that and think, oh, so that God might impute the perfect righteousness of Christ to us and we would be saved. Well, that's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about imputed righteousness here. He's talking about practical righteousness. He's talking about personal righteousness. God gave us his son so that we might become like him, so that we might obey him. Remember what Paul's dilemma, O oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me? Well, this is what delivers him. This is what Paul was after. He delighted in the law of God, and he wanted to keep it, but his flesh kept getting in the way. But this is the solution. This is how it's overcome, how he overcame it. And this is how we can overcome it as well. Verse 4 again, by not walking according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Remember what he says in Galatians 5, 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Well, there you go. See, that, that's the key. That's the solution. Sounds simple, doesn't it? 
But what does it really mean? Well, to walk according to something, here we kind of have to think about it because it's kind of a broad concept. Uh, to live in a, is, is really to live in a way that corresponds to, to that thing or to that person because, you know, there's the flesh and the spirit. The flesh is a thing. The spirit is a person that is consistent with its character, okay, that emulates or imitates. Let me give you an example. To walk according to Christ, what do you think that means? It would be to live, because to walk means to live, in a way that we know is consistent with the way that he lived, right? To follow his example. Now, Paul goes on to elaborate a little bit more about what this means in verse 5. He says, for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. To set your, or excuse me, to live according to the flesh means to set your mind on the things of the flesh. And what does he mean by that? Well, it means to, what you might think, to think about those things. To think constantly or continuously on the things that are of the flesh, of sin, that are contrary to God, the things of the world that are not pleasing to Him, but the things that He hates. Because in your heart... These are the things you want to do. It's to have your mind captivated by the world, by the flesh. To live according to the Spirit means to set your mind on the things of the Spirit, to think constantly on the things that God loves, because in your heart, that's really what you want to do. Now, we're going to see a little bit more about this, but Paul, first of all, wants to point out where these two paths actually lead. The mindset on the flesh, he says in verse 6, leads to death. It leads to condemnation. But the mindset on the spirit leads to eternal life and peace. Now, Paul tells us there is no condemnation in Christ, verse 1, because, and his point is this, because he has given to us his Holy Spirit to lead us to heaven. Okay? Following the spirit leads to life and peace. Following the flesh leads to death and condemnation. He's broken the power of sin so that we can walk by the Spirit and take the path that leads to life. So again, what is the key to overcoming the flesh? Well, according to this, we have to set our minds. And by the way, when, when Paul says mind, he also includes heart. And I think that's one of the reasons why Jonathan Edwards, for one, included the affections within the mind and didn't make that separate as he thinks about the different faculties that are, in, that, that are in us. In the mind, he includes the affections. And I think Paul is doing the same thing here. We have to set our minds and our hearts on the things of the Holy Spirit. And now that, what that means is this. We have to be in the things that the Spirit of God gives to us. We have to be in His Word, reading and meditating on His Word. Is it important that we read the Bible? Sometimes we think, well, you know what, I know what the Bible teaches, so I really don't have to. Don't have to read it every day, don't have to spend time in it. But you know how easy it is for us to forget. And you know how God speaks through His Word and how we need to be in the Word of God. Those who have been most useful to the Lord in the history of the church have been those who have been in His Word the most. Why? Because those people were setting their minds on the things of the Spirit. Meditating on His truths, His commands, His promises, everything that the Lord tells us, even about reality. It, it's so easy to forget what the world really is when all we're looking at is, that, is the world through the world's eyes. Okay? The way we see things the way we should see them is through the, the Word of God. And that's what it means to set our minds on the things of the Spirit. We need to let the love that He's given us for these things fill our hearts. We need to pray that He would give us more, that we would become obsessed with these things. You know, thinking about obsession, we're, we're dog sitting right now. We've got this little dog. It's, um, I forget exactly what kind of dog, some kind of a poodle mix, but it's a real small dog. It has a one-track mind, okay? All it wants to do is play. It discovered the ball not too long ago, and we brought out a ball, and that thing was so obsessed with that ball, 
It couldn't think of anything else, and so when we finally had enough of it and put it out of the way, all that dog could do was stand next to where the ball was and whine and complain. All it wanted was that ball. This dog was obsessed, okay? Now, that's a bad thing if you're obsessed with a bad thing, right? Or something that is irrelevant. The Lord wants us to be obsessed in, in that way with, with Him, with His kingdom, with His his word, his commandments, his way of living, his, his mission, okay? That's what it means to set our mind on the things of the Spirit so that we follow the Spirit. The title of the sermon is what? Uh, Let the Spirit lead you. God's given us the Spirit of God to give us a love for the things of the Lord and to lead us in that direction. We need to follow him so that we consistently make the choices that Jesus would make because Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so that's what he did. He always did the things that the Spirit of God was leading him to do. And again, remember what Jonathan Edwards said in this context, we will always choose what we are most strongly inclined towards. That's true. Um, that's why we need to shift our inclinations toward the things of the Lord. That's why we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, as Paul tells us in Ephesians 5. Be filled with His influence, His love, and be taken up in the things of the Spirit. And those are the things of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Now, is this an easy thing to do? No, it, it is a struggle. It is a battle. It's the battle that Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 7. But it's the only way that we can overcome this, this flesh, the only way we can win this war. It is a, something we must do. Remember, sanctification is a cooperative effort. We must work with the Spirit. Now, Paul doesn't just leave it there. He, he gives us motivation, and positive and negative motivation. The negative motivation is, is quite scary. Now, first of all, to motivate us to distance ourselves further from the flesh, Paul explains what a mind set on the flesh is really like and why it leads to condemnation in verses 7 and 8. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, uh, this really describes an unbeliever, doesn't it? because there's no struggle for them. They, they just want sin, and they don't want the law. Uh, they don't want to do God's law or do, do things His way. So they will go this other way. But we need to realize that this also describes the tendencies that are still inside of us because of the sin that is in us. Otherwise, it wouldn't be relevant to his discussion at all. And what Paul is saying is the more we set our minds on the things of the flesh the more we're going to find these things in us. So what is the mindset on the flesh like? Well, first of all, it's hostile toward God. It hates Him. And so it drives people away from Him. That's why Paul, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, even though they knew God, they didn't honor Him or glorify Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creation. And that's why God's bringing judgment on the world. They hate God and they will not have Him as God. R.C. said on one occasion regarding himself, love God, sometimes I hate him. That's kind of a shocking thing to hear, you know, somebody like R.C. Sproul say, but what he was expressing was something that sometimes we also express or experience because of the flesh. Well, secondly, it refuses to submit to the law. The reason is because it wants the opposite of the law, it wants to sin. But that's why we struggle to obey. That's why the struggle is within us because... We have this in us. And it's obvious that those who are completely in this state cannot please God. In unbelievers, we call this total depravity, which brings total inability. And that's why they will never trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved because they don't want Him. God has to give His Holy Spirit to them before anyone will want to come to Jesus, before anyone will want to serve Him because all they are is flesh, and all the flesh is, is hatred, hostility, non-submission to God. Now, Paul's asking the question, is, is that what you want? No, that's not what we want. We have the Spirit of God. We want something better. 
Paul didn't want this either. Remember, he was struggling with the flesh and the fruit it was bringing, which is why he rejoices that God gave him his Holy Spirit to set him free. He continues in verse 9, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, he's not saying there's no longer any flesh, okay? That's why sometimes it's hard to understand exactly what Paul's saying. We're not in the flesh, we're in the Spirit. It's not, it's not me who's doing the sin, it's the flesh in me. I, the new me, is delighting in the law of God. Well, this is the new me. I'm in the Spirit. I'm not in the flesh, but the flesh is still present. But being in the Spirit, we don't have to live according to the flesh any longer. This new desire the Spirit has given us has freed us. We can live a new kind of life. Now, Paul digresses just a bit, and he says this, if we didn't have the Spirit at all, we would not belong to Christ. We would be unbelievers. We would still be enslaved to sin. Remember, the only difference between the believer and the unbeliever, remember Spurgeon saying this, and, and everyone who knows the Scriptures would agree with this, is that the believer has the Spirit. The unbeliever does not. Now, Paul goes on to show us another benefit of having the Spirit of God. And so we, you know, he, here he has told us how we can be free uh, from this sin, and that is the Spirit of God has given us freedom. We need to walk according to the Spirit. Again, follow Him in all those things we've just seen. But He goes on to show us another benefit. And here, you know, sometimes the New Testament writers, they don't write quite as tidy as we like. Sometimes it seems like they sort of, as things occur to them, they write these things down, and they're very, very important things. We might organize it a little bit differently, but this is what we have. But this is what He says, that our bodies one day are also going to be redeemed. Now, if the Spirit of God is in us, he says, then Christ is in us. And if Christ is in us, though our bodies are dead because of sin, even though that sin is still at work in our members, and even though sometimes it still bears this fruit for death, okay, even though they're still under the curse, even though they're still going to grow old and die, even though we still have to wrestle with our bodily desires, our spirits are alive because of His righteousness. They have been redeemed. Now, Paul has been talking about the inner man. He's been talking about the soul. And he seems to almost be putting the sin that we're struggling with in our bodies rather than in our souls. And, and that is a question which we don't have time to really untangle right now. But what he's saying is, okay, We've been liberated. Our souls are liberated. We can delight in it. We can carry out now what we want to do through the, the members of our bodies. But our bodies still don't seem to be experiencing that redemption that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're still under the curse of death. They're still going to grow old and die. There's, there's still the sin at work in it. But he says there's hope for that too. Here's, here's further good news. He says, if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead, verse 11, dwells in us, then he, the Father, who raised Jesus will also raise our bodies through his spirit who indwells us. What he's saying is one day our bodies will also be redeemed. Now, in a certain sense, they have already, right? We, we are united with Christ if we have trusted in him. And that means not just our souls, but also our bodies. But so there's this already aspect to our redemption, but there's also the not yet. Uh, we haven't been completely liberated from the curse of sin and, you know, the, the, the sin is still working in our members. But Paul says, and this is something that uh, he's going to deal with in our, in our text next time, that he will redeem them when He comes to redeem the creation at the second coming. If you were here for the, you know, the evening series, we saw that when Jesus comes again, that He's going to raise all the dead. And when He does that, the creation at the same time is going to be set free from its corruption. So there is redemption for the body, which is yet ahead. But in the meantime, we're still struggling, but we have that hope, and that's a wonderful hope. So what is Paul's conclusion? He says this, and, and here again, this perhaps is the most important thing that he has to say. If the Lord 
has freed us from sin by his spirit and promised that one day he's also going to free our bodies. This places us under an obligation, okay? We are debtors to God's grace. Remember how the psalmist in Psalm 116 asked this question, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? And he answers, I shall lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I shall pay my vows to the Lord. Oh, may it be in the presence of all his people. He understood the grace of God makes us debtors to the grace of God, a debt of gratitude. We can't pay back what God has done for us, but we do owe him something. We owe him everything. And so what does Paul say his grace calls us to do? Verse 12, that we are no longer to give our minds and hearts to the things of the flesh. Paul says if we do that, we will die. Okay, now understand what he's saying here. He's saying that if we walk according to the flesh, if that's the way we continue throughout our lives, in the end we will be condemned regardless of what we happen to think about ourselves. Think about the people, again, the, the evangelicals, and I've heard many of them, who say, if you prayed the prayer, it doesn't matter how you live, you know, you're still going to heaven. It doesn't matter if you do anything for Christ. It doesn't matter if you serve Him, worship Him. It doesn't matter. You've trusted Christ. That's all that matters. Paul is saying, no, that's not all that matters. If you have trusted Christ, you will no longer walk according to the flesh. And if you walk according to the flesh, you will die. You are a debtor to His grace. You must walk according to the Spirit. So then he says, if instead we put the things of the flesh to death by following the Spirit, and again, that's the only way we can put the deeds of the body to death is by walking according to the Spirit, by setting our minds on His truth, being filled with His love, turning from our sins, walking again in the way that He calls us to walk putting to death those, those sinful inclinations. Again, we, you know, it, think of it as a continuum, right? You've got love for God and you've got love for sin. The more you go and the more you love God, the less you will love sin. So the more you walk according to the Spirit, the more you're going to love God, the more you're going to be inclined toward the things of God, and the less you're going to be inclined to do the things of the flesh, this is how you put this to death, is by walking according to the Spirit, being filled with the love of God and those inclinations versus the sinful inclinations. John Owen talked about it as fighting, a, a, you know, you're locked in a room with the wild beast. Remember that illustration? And he says that wild beast, say it's a, a lion or something like that. It's, it's going to get hungry and it's going to eat you. It's going to kill you unless you take the, you know, the, what do you call it, knife in your hand and you start poking holes in it and you let out its blood and you weaken it, you know, to the point where it can't, it can't hurt you. Now, you're not going to be able to kill it, but you need to weaken it enough so it doesn't kill you. And that's what's going on here. How do we do that? Well, again, we have to deny the flesh. We need to put off those sinful inclinations, but we need stronger inclinations to overcome them, which is why we need the Spirit and walk according to the Spirit and to be filled with the Spirit. If we do that, Paul says, we will live. Now, again, what is he saying here? He's not saying you have to earn your salvation, but what he is saying is that if there is no sanctification, then there is no justification. If we are justified, we will do these things. He says in verse 14, those who are led by the Spirit belong to God. These are the sons of God. These are the daughters of God. Those who were led by the Spirit, which is, again, what he's talking about through this whole passage. This is how we overcome sin. This is how we put it to death. We need to walk according to the Spirit. We'll be led by the Spirit. Now, Paul does end with one additional blessing we can expect if the Spirit of God is in us, and that is his witness. How do we know? Well, how do we know we're saved? How do we know we have the Spirit of God in us in a saving way? Well, one way is we're putting our sins to death walking according to the Spirit. But here's another way, which doesn't take the place of the first. He's not saying this is an alternate way. Okay, but this will be there as well. This, the witness of the Spirit. Now, he says, first of all, the, the Spirit we received is not like the one that we were under before, you know, the law of, you know, the, the law of uh, sin and death, the flesh, the sin, the old man. 
had us bound in sin, led us to death, bore fruit for death and condemnation. No, this spirit is a spirit of adoption, okay? a filial spirit, one who gives us the confidence that we belong to God so that we can actually call Him Father. Now, here's this expression, Abba, Father. What does it mean? Well, Abba, as you, know, as you probably know, is the Aramaic word for Father. Pater in the Greek, which is the second word translated Father, is the Greek translation of the Aramaic word um, Abba. And both of them mean Father, Father, Father. Okay? So what's the significance of this? Well, for one thing, the, uh, the Jews, the, the common languages of the day, I mean, they, yes, they did speak Hebrew, and they read Hebrew, and Hebrew was in the synagogue and so forth, but the common languages of the day were Aramaic and Greek. Okay, well, why both of these words? It's the reason it's believed is because these are the words that Jesus used when he was praying to his Father in the garden on the night before his crucifixion. He cries out, Abba, Father, if you are willing, let this cup pass from me. This is the most intimate and endearing way that we can express or we can address God as, as our Father, the way that Jesus expressed. The way the Spirit of God testifies to us that we are the children of God is by giving us the confidence to be able to say this and to know that it's true. And Paul wants us to know that if it's true, if we are by the Spirit putting to death the deeds of the flesh, if we're walking according to the Spirit, if we have the Spirit of adoption working within us, giving us the confidence to, to address God in this most intimate way, then we can also know that we are the heirs of the kingdom, which is not exactly the same as, okay, we're saved, okay? We belong to God, but it's part of the package and a wonderful part of it, right? We are the heirs of His eternal kingdom and fellow heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our, our elder brother, our head, the one who earned the kingdom, and through our union with Him, that kingdom also belongs to us. What a wonderful thing. This is how we know we belong to God. This is how we overcome our sins. Um, and there's a glorious future. This is how we know it belongs to us. Now, as I've said, Paul does address one more idea in this verse, that of suffering, because... You know, if, if we are putting our sins to death and walking according to the Spirit, guess what? We're going to suffer too. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer. But that's a topic that opens up the next section, so we'll look at that next week. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and let's just think about some of the things that we have seen um, and use them to examine our experience, our commitment to the Lord, as we prepare to come to the table. Let's spend a few moments in prayer.